talking about, uh, you know, kind of go over the various ways that we can use uh, use herbs. I mean, obviously the first thing that comes to our mind is cooking. You can see that I've got a lot of stuff up here that you probably have in your spice cupboard at home. I've got uh, sage and mint, parsley, basil, thyme. I've also got a few things that maybe not all of you have used yet. Uh, you know, Ken Lane's mother, Marty, she puts lavender in all kinds of things. I've been trying to steal some recipes from her, but I haven't uh, I've been able to get uh, get those just yet. So it's something I, I want to play with. Uh, rosemary. Uh, you could probably smell this a few rows back. <laughs> this is extremely fragrant. Sometimes this is used in recipes just for the aromatic uh, qualities. So we, we're very familiar with, uh, with cooking with herbs. Personally, I rely heavily on my herbs when I'm cooking. I use a lot of garlic and oregano, thyme, uh, rosemary. I actually don't even use a lot of uh, salts in my food. I, I almost never use salt, and when I do, it's the slightest sprinkle because there's so much flavor coming from the herbs. I don't really have to do much else. I don't have to rely on heavily on things like salts and butters and, and stuff like that. I don't even use a, a whole lot of uh, oils. I just use like a, a little bit of coconut oil or maybe a little olive and I rely very heavily on the garlics and the oreganos and the, the, the different herbs. So don't be afraid to really uh, go heavily on these for flavor. Sometimes it's wonderful just to take some fresh herbs like thyme or basil and just put it on some cheeses, fruits, vegetables. Wonderful. Wonderful. I think we, we had a, a nerd class once where Laura, uh, a lot of you might remember Laura, uh, she came in with some cheeses that she had mixed herbs in with, and I fell in love with rosemary cream cheese. It's so simple. You just take cream cheese and you mix in fresh rosemary and let it sit overnight and put it on a crackers the next day. Oh, I, I fell in love with that. Amazing. In fact, I was even thinking of how it sounds really good this week. So uh, lots of wonderful uses for them uh, in culinary use, but we'll also talk about some of the other uses, uh, for example, medicinal, um, their repellent uses for uh, getting rid of insects in the garden. Let's face it, most of us here are here because we're actually gardeners. We're not just uh, interested in the herbs, we're gardeners in general. So the uses for these plants in the garden, um, we'll, we'll go over some of those as well. They really uh, have a very wide range of uses. They're even good for landscape use. It might surprise you. you. If you look up here, you can see I've got roses, I've got lantana and mahonia, I've got barberry, I've got juniper. You're used to seeing these in your landscape. Actually, they have herbal uses. But even the ones that you're used to thinking of as for cooking, they have uses in the, in the landscape as well. In fact, uh, Right here, this is a good one to go over. This is thyme. Uh, you're used to using this for cooking. Actually, there's several different varieties. Some of them are super low growing. They make really pretty lawns, actually. We, we planted a, a number of thyme lawns. They grow fast, have wonderful coverage, take light traffic. Uh, so this one is uh, English thyme. This one gets rather tall. If you were to put this in, uh, you'd definitely be mowing it on a regular basis, but some of them only get uh, anywhere from half an inch to two inches. There's a, a several that stay within that range. So they make excellent ground covers, and you can actually plant the thyme lawn. So if you, say, had a place where uh, you needed something soft, you couldn't use gravel to, to uh, use in a patch of the yard, you could absolutely plant a thyme lawn. So they have a lot of uses. Um, so we'll, let's kind of look at some of the different things that we have up here. I think I said this last week, I, I don't know if I can even teach a class anymore without bringing a rose up because they have so many uses. Uh, the rose actually is one of the most versatile, one of the most important when it comes to herbal remedies. It has so many uses, it's amazing. The, the list is very long, I couldn't possibly go over it. In fact. Pretty much almost everything up here has such a long list of uses, we will not go 
over everything. We can't. So what I like to do is sometimes, if you, if you ever sit down with a verb book, you'll flip through it and you'll be amazed at what you see. And, you, and you'll start taking notes. Oh, I could use that. Oh, I could use that. I could definitely use that. So we'll, we'll go uh, over just a few things that kind of jump out at me when I think of some of these herbs or when I go through the herb books uh, looking for different uses. And every, every person's going to find something different that is helpful to them. Uh, you will definitely see roses in every herb book, every single one, and not a single one of those books will have an exhaustive list for what they're good for. They're just amazing to have. Uh, I think some of the things that had jumped out at me uh, for the roses, one, they're higher in vitamin C, far more than, say, oranges, ounce for ounce. They surpass oranges a great deal, very high in vitamin C. Uh, if you take too much of it, it could turn into a diuretic because of all that vitamin C. The, <laughs> Uh, the rose hips is where you get the vitamin C if you're, you're wondering. A lot of the benefits from roses, just almost every part of the rose is actually good for something. Uh, mainly the petals, the hips, and the, and the roots are the ones that are most common, but the hips and the petals are where most of the, uh, the uses come from. Uh, so that, that hip that forms after the rose uh, has lost its petals, that is where most of that vitamin C is and a lot of other health benefits and have a very wide range of uses. And just taking them on a regular basis is, is very good for you. Uh, some, some people say you should be actually drinking rose tea every day just for the vitamin C and the other benefits that come from it. It's, it's nutritional. So very, very good. Um, you can use the petals to make rose water, which has a large range of uses for medicinal and cosmetic uh, purposes. Um, it's excellent for the skin. Um, I've seen it used for certain types of eye uh, eye problems. Um, you can take it internally for various things. It's just very versatile. My issue with, with herbs is that I can't remember all the uses, so you'll notice that I will have to look sometimes at this little, these little notes here that I was taking just, just to kind of refresh my memory on what some of this stuff can be used for. It's just that there's so many uses, I can't memorize everything. Generally what I do, if I have an ailment, then I go looking for remedies for that specific ailment. I can't memorize what everything is used for. There's just too many. So what I'll do is I'll look for a specific, a specific use or ailment. So let's say that you want to look for uh, you know, something for, uh, what would be a good one? You probably noticed earlier I, I, I rub my hands a lot. Let's say I wanted to look for something to, to ease the rheumatism that unfortunately does uh, run in my family. I can look something up specifically for that. So I would... I would pull up something uh, for rheumatism and joint pain, and I would start getting things like bay leaf. Bay leaf is, is excellent for aches, pains, arthritis, rheumatism. Like I said, they run kind of early in my family. It's just the way it is. Um, what was the other one? There's a... Basil is also good for aches and pains. And the other one, and these are some things that I'm about to start using myself for this very reason. I was looking it up because, you know, the, that um, joint inflammation and, and muscular aches are starting to kick in for me. I'm starting to look up things that work for that. Uh, rose hips was another one, actually. Like I said, very versatile. We'll keep coming back to this. This is an amazing, amazing plant. We'll keep coming back to that. Uh, so rose hips, bay leaf, things like that. The other way you can go is if you have things already in your yard or in your herb garden that you, perhaps you're using for culinary uses, start looking up those herbs specifically. It might surprise you to find out that, oh, those have other uses that I could use. So look, look things up that way. And even for culinary use, uh, we're used to, the, to looking at a recipe and it tells us what herbs to use. Try looking up an herb and see what it's good to be used on and start experimenting and have fun with that and, and you'll, you'll start finding, oh, this is really good for poultry or fruit or vegetables. I'm going to try that and try it out and you'll find out it's your new favorite. So uh, You can actually do things in reverse like that and just start experimenting and, and throwing it into uh, usually sautés and salads and stir fries 
are a great way to experiment with that. You just take some simple ingredients like whatever vegetables and meats you like to use and throw in the herbs and just have fun with it like that. Now not all of the, the uses for these herbs have to do with soothing aches and pains. Uh, let's say we want something for skin. You probably notice that without the help of makeup, I do have a lot of dark spots in my skin. So what, you know, what is good for that? Um, in fact, I just ran into someone yesterday. Uh, thank you, Lori, for bringing this in. Um, this is a, a sugar scrub. It's actually a mixture of sugars and oils. It's actually very simple. It's two parts sugar, one part oil, or sometimes a little lemon juice is added. And then you add some herbs to it that are good for the skin. This one is lavender. Uh, there's a number of herbs that you can use. Lavender and rose are actually two of the, the best that you can use for your skin. These are excellent exfoliators and for lightening skin tone. Something I think I, I better start trying myself because I, do, uh, I don't have much of a complexion anymore. So there's a lot of things that you can use this for and it's just plain good for your skin. Lavender and rose hips are also, like I said, excellent for eczema and pains. I use them in foot baths. <laughs> believe me, I'm on my feet all day long on this concrete. So you can better believe I'm using them for foot baths. So lots and lots of uses for these herbs. Let's see, let's uh, kind of start. Like I said, I can't memorize everything, so you'll see me looking at my cheat sheet from, from time to time. This one I have at home. I love my aloe vera, and I wish I had started using it so much sooner. I, I get a lot of use out of the aloe. Um, again, uh, I sometimes get uh, some blemishes on my face, and I tend to scratch at them too much. I find that I just take a little bit of the aloe and, and apply, and it takes care of helping them to heal. They're excellent for burns. You will be amazed at how good this is. I used to be a cook. We kept aloe vera in the kitchen. You're gonna get burned from time to time, sometimes even nasty ones, and blister up real good. This is amazing on burns. You put this on and you immediately feel relief, and it really helps the burns to heal. I even have a friend who tells me that she actually had a third degree burn on her hand. She used aloe vera. They had to cancel her skin graft. That's how effective this stuff is. It's one of those things where you can't really hurt anything by trying it, you know, on your skin. Um, you can eat it. Uh, there are even recipes for it, but you don't want to use it too much, just like anything else. So, you know, look up some recipes to get an idea of how much you can consume. They're good in smoothies and things like that. But on your skin, you really can't go wrong. Uh, it's good for skin, just regular skin health. Just using it for various uh, things or for just a daily routine, it's great for that. Um, and then using it for any kind of blemishes, scrapes, cuts, uh, you know, anything uh, shallow on your skin that, uh, where it's been abrased or burned or anything like that, trust me, it really does work. And it helps it to scar a lot less too. And, uh, leave those permanent dark spots and, and scars that start building up after a while. Uh, let's see. Let's see, uh, the, what's another one we can go over? Oh, the basil. This one has a lot of uses. Now, uh, I, I guess I should mention that the care of each plant as I'm going over. The aloe vera is okay outside. Sometimes it needs to be in a shady spot during the summer. But during the winter, you must bring it in. Do not let it go below about, oh, 41, 42 degrees. That's, that's its absolute limit. And it doesn't really care for wild um, temperature swings either. So you kind of want to uh, be careful about taking it from one spot and putting it into another where it's drastically different. You know, say way more sun than it's used to or anything like that. You'll st sometimes get discoloration that says, oh, that was, too quick, I want it to be more gradual. But it's otherwise actually very easy. It is a succulent, so low water usage. And uh, just basically, it needs good light. But it doesn't necessarily have to be sitting out in the baking sun. It does need to be good light though. So put it in your window while you're keeping it in the house, or on the porch in the shade during the summer is fine. Uh, the basil, 
Now, um, when I look up herbs, honestly, there are certain uh, things that a lot of the cooking herbs have in common. And so you'll see the same uh, remedies over and over again, uh, same uses over and over again. Like a lot of them have antifungal or antibacterial properties. A lot of them are great for sore throats and digestion. Uh, so you'll see that in a lot of these. This is just another one of them that has that, but it does have, I, I tried to look up the ones that are specific to each herb or that are more common uses that we might actually use. Uh, this one being um, antifungal, I didn't know that. I did know lavender was. I actually did have issues with fungal infections uh, for a couple of years because I was working uh, outside, I was in the planting crew, I was working out and you know, sweating and had a lot of humidity from the, the monsoon like we're having right now. And I would get little uh, fungal problems on my skin in various spots. I had it around my nose, uh, on my arm, in the, in the crooks of my arm, I had issues with that. And so at first I was using things like, uh, you know, the Tenactin and whatever, and then I tried using, uh, and it, which is effective, but uh, then I decided I want to try using uh, something herbal. I tried the lavender, and actually was very effective. A little bit of uh, lavender uh, in coconut oil. It's something you don't want to make it too strong because it actually starts to reverse on itself if you make it too strong. So uh, some of these antifungal remedies are actually very effective. Uh, I've used them myself, so this is one that has those antifungal properties and it's also good for things like indigestion and other types of stomach and intestinal problems. And it tastes good. It's also good as a, a little, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? A uh, breath freshener. So you can actually just take off a, a little leaf, uh, put that in your mouth and chew it up for a little bit. It'll have freshen your breath. It won't have ingredients you can't pronounce like a lot of breath mints do. <laughs> So this is an excellent one, especially if mint is a little too strong for you. It is for me, but basil works for me. So I'll, I'll sometimes use that. Ella, while you, before you get started again, could you start the sign-up sheet around? So, sure. Because there's quite a few people here to get. Sure. Them. I'm going to start passing this around. Give me just a sec. I'm going to start passing this around. Um, if you put your email address on this, then he will send you uh, a handout for this class. Uh, which one are we handing out today? Do you uh, I'll figure that one out okay. once, once I find out for sure what you're, yeah. you've covered. <laughs> yeah. But th yeah, there's we'll a bunch of different stuff on herbs. Uh, that, yeah, that we've got things on herbs and edible flowers and all kinds of stuff. So he'll be uh, attaching uh, at least one of those uh, to the emails. And also you'll get a link to the recorded uh, summary of this class. So you'll be getting those in the email if you want to pass that around for anybody who wants that information. Yes. Can you tell us how to successfully grow the basil? The first year I was here, it was really successful. Every other year, it was dying. Okay. So basil is one of those. You kind of have to find the right spot for it. It's happy in most places, but every now and then, you know, when it gets unusually hot or cold, it can give you a little bit of trouble. Um, it doesn't want, it can be out in the full sun in most cases, but if you have a real hot yard, and let's face it, a lot of the newer homes are hot, then you might have to, you know, bring it into the patio where it only gets partial daylight or under a tree or something. Uh, some of those new yards, um, not only are they are in some of the hotter parts of the Prescott, Prescott Valley area, but also um, I think the, the yards are just getting hotter because of the way they're built. Uh, like I said, I was in the planting crew for a couple of years and I would walk into someone's backyard and I can feel the temperature skyrocket as soon as I got back there. You have that gravel and that block wall. Nobody does fences anymore. They're, they're all doing uh, this block wall. Great for privacy, great for being long lasting. But goodness, like, you're walking into a stone oven and then you have a stucco house on, on the, the fourth side. So you're, you're walking into this, this great big stone oven and it gets really hot. So if you're having heat issues, just kind of pull it into a place where it can get afternoon shade. That's what I've done in the past. Works great. Um, I wouldn't put it in darkness or shade too much. It should get at least some light, uh, either indirect bright light or morning light, something like that. For those of us uh, who work, live in a little more foresty areas, it's not so intense. You can put them pretty much anywhere because it's just not as hot up here 
because it's from Butte, Granite Mountain area, it's just not as bad. Uh, as far as watering goes, uh, with herb fuel, you need to have regular water, but not uh, not to overdo it. The, the basil, certainly you'll want to have regular watering. How big uh, your pot is is going to determine how often you actually have to water. It might be every day, it might be every week. A bigger, a bigger pot does not dry out as fast. And again, some of you have hotter yards than others, so it, it's just going to vary according to where it's planted. Is it in the ground? In a raised bed, in a small pot, so it's going to vary a little bit. Other than that, I find they do pretty good. Yes. Can it go all year? This one, no. This one, unless you bring it in for the winter, it's not going to make it through. It can't take the cold. Uh, a lot of herbs can. This is one that cannot. So if you're getting close to the end of season, uh, harvest whatever's left and dry it and save it. Uh, or bring it inside if it's in a pot and you can bring it inside, you can do that, put it on your windowsill or something. Let's see. Again, that's that's a really good versatile herb for cooking and culinary use too. Question, so if you have them outside with it in the ground, mm -hmm. can you pop them to bring them inside? Do they transfer that well? Great question. So her question was, if I have it planted in the ground and I want to dig it up, bring it inside for the winter, can I do that? Well, in a lot of the cases, yes. Some of them, no. Um, the basil, you could try. No guarantees. Uh, some of them, like for example, here we go, cilantro. This one's got a long tap root. You damage that tap root, it's done. So, no. If this is something you're gonna bring in for the winter, uh, it better be in a pot, otherwise it's not gonna happen. Really, I would suggest that for any of them. If you're planning already, uh, when you plant it, uh, to bring them in for the winter, just put it in a pot right to begin with. But if you decide to change your mind later after you've already put it in the ground, well, some of them will make it, some of them will, will not. This is probably the one that just you will not get away with at all, the cilantro. Can you tell us a little bit more about the cilantro? Yeah, cilantro is another one of those, of all the herbs I've grown, I think this one's the most finicky, yeah. <laughs> to be <Yes>. honest. <laughs> uh, be careful when planting it. So again, they have a long tap root. You don't want to damage it. So try to, uh, now this is good. It doesn't have too many roots, you know, spiraling around underneath the pot. So we want to take this out gently. And uh, so there we go. And I don't see any uh, thick roots spiraling around so that we have to worry about damaging. So I can go ahead and, and kind of rough this up a little bit, um, tear at it gently, but be careful because I don't want to damage the, the tap. Uh, so don't go ripping this thing apart. Most people I find, what did I do with it? There we go. <laughs> Most people I find are pretty gentle with, with uh, plant roots. Every now and then you'll meet someone that really tears at them. So if you're one of those that can get pretty rough, um, this is not one of those that you can get away with on, on that. Um, this is, you just need to think of this really as a short-lived kind of plant. Uh, generally, it'll do great in uh, cooler weather. As soon as it gets warm, it just bolts and then dies. Um, when it bolts, that means that it flowers. And so it'll they suddenly stop producing all the leaves and they'll just kind of shrink away and it'll put all its energy into the flowers. Those flowers, actually, if you let them go to seed, that's coriander seed. So this is actually two herbs in one. That's coriander. Uh, but other than that, it's one of those you're just going to replant it from time to time. So don't panic if you see it die. It's not your fault. It's just kind of its life cycle. Don't worry about it. How many, if you cut it, as for, or how many times will it come back? Or will it continue to oh, yeah, it'll just keep coming back. Yeah, so with all these herbs, you just keep cutting them and they keep growing back more. So, yeah, by all means, go ahead and cut it. Um, I use cilantro for Thai cooking. Most of you uh, are very fond of Mexican cooking, and so you're very familiar with it uh, for that. Me, I have to uh, have a fresh cilantro. The thing about fresh cilantro is it doesn't retain its flavor well when dried. This is something that really needs to be fresh. Um, another alternative, if you re really need to be able to keep it around but can't, uh, you know, always have fresh on hand or be able to run out and get fresh and you want to have it on hand because you use it so much, you can put it in ice cubes. That's a, another great way to go. Uh, what you would do is you, you take 
uh, take the leaves, put them into the ice trays, and fill them only halfway with water, because you're going to find that they float to the top. The leaves are going to float to the top and not be submerged. Don't even try. Put that into the freezer and freeze them solid, pull them out. Now you can refill uh, the rest of the way with water, or you can use uh, half oil if you want. And then freeze them again, and that way they're actually submerged. Yes? How much do you actually count those or cut those little plants down? How much? Oh, goodness gracious, you can really take at it. You can, you can go for it for most of these herbs, yeah. And, and also, what about using a siphoning system? You know, self-irrigating Oh, okay. Um, it depends on the herb, uh, but yes, you could absolutely use a self-irrigating system. Um, if it's in the ground, you can go drip irrigation. If it's inside, you can have those, those cycling systems. Um, you could even go hydroponic with many of these. Um, I would say with these, uh, just learn the herb itself. Some of them uh, actually like to dry out, so make sure that the system is not coming on too often. Because I know some of those cycling systems, they come on every day or multiple times a day. So just a, it's just a matter of making sure it comes on uh, the right number of cycles per day, per week, whatever. Uh, some of these, for example, sage, oregano, they like it on the dry side. They want to dry out in between waterings. The rosemary, this is another one. These actually like to go kind of dry. If they're in a pot, you're probably going to water about once a week. Uh, that's what I do at home. It's a little bit different for everybody again. Your, hot, my, your yard might be a little hotter than mine. Uh, it might be that your pots are smaller than mine and dry out faster. But right now, lately it's been pretty hot. I've actually been watering as much as twice a week on, on most everything, actually, which is unusual for me. But some of them have been in those pots for a while. And I've noticed that I need to do a good drenching on some of them. They're not absorbing as well as they should. Maybe it's just time to refresh the soil, repot them, uh, so they're not absorbing as well as they should. And I need to either um, get them to start absorbing again somehow by either new potting or just giving them a good drench with the hose. Yes. Okay. So, so the question is, uh, do you need to replace the soil if you're planting in the ground? No, you don't need to replace it, but I would definitely recommend that you amend it. Now for most of us, we have clay. It's very dense, it's very hard, doesn't breathe well, uh, doesn't drain well. And then for people in the Granite Mountain Thumb Butte area, you have disintegrated granite, which is kind of the exact opposite. So amending either of those with compost helps to regulate that soil. It regulates the drainage with the water retention. Uh, so it, it'll help aerate, it'll help bring life back into the soil. It'll get the worms and, and the beneficial microbes living. It'll get things actually living and breathing and producing down there. You actually should have an ecosystem in your soil, not just earth. And most of us have fill dirt. It's not natural. It's not topsoil. It's not what you would find out there in the forest in nature. It's actually just dead earth. So it actually does have to be amended. Don't skimp on it, please. So get some of the, the premium mulch and some uh, all-purpose fertilizer. Mix that in, and you're good to go. Let's see, uh, this one that I'm holding is oregano. Which one do I have? I think this is the Italian oregano. This one is good for a lot of things. It's a good thick brown cover if you've got some uh, slopes that can use some covering. Um, this one I use a lot for cooking. It has a lot of herbal uses and I can't remember what they are. <laughs> but they're really good uses. <laughs> and I. It's a good thing I don't even have to think about it because it's already in my diet. I love this stuff. I love to, to cook with it. I love the flavor of oregano. I use it a lot for any kind of Mediterranean or Italian kind of style dishes or even stuff that I just don't even think about what 
country that it comes from, but garlic and oregano end up in a lot of my dishes unless they're Asian. So this is just one of those things that's pretty regular. And like I said, it's got some great uses and I can't remember what they were. <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't think I wrote them down. But uh, this is a, another really good one. Again, uh, during the winter time, uh, this will go dormant. You can leave this outside. It's perennial, it's cold hardy. You can leave this outside year round. So you can put it in the ground, you can put it in pots, whatever you want to do. And it'll go dormant in the winter, which means you won't be able to harvest during the winter. So if you want to uh, preserve it, you can dry it, you can put it in oil, you can put it in ice cubes, pretty much whatever you want to do. It's good all those ways. So just before uh, it freezes and you lose all of it, harvest everything and it'll start producing in the, in the spring. So save up for winter on the oregano. This is another one that's excellent for ground covers. This is mint. Those of you who have planted this know once you have mint, you will always have mint. <laughs> This actually has a lot of uses, um, not only for um, culinary and herbal uses, it's great for like stomach problems, any kind of indigestion. It's good for cooling. If, uh, for any, any reason, whether it be uh, any kind of like uh, uh, heat or inflammation in the skin, um, you know, it, uh, things that are kind of irritating, um, it has a cooling effect. Great for breath freshener, again, uh, in the old days, this is what a lot of people use. They would just chew on a leaf. It has a cooling effect. So it's great for a lot of things. This is great to have around your garden, especially those of you who have vegetable gardens. You're gonna want mint, if you can stand it, which you probably can. <laughs> Most people love mint. I am a weirdo, okay? I confess, I am such a weirdo. I don't like mint. I don't like the smell of it. So it's something I don't use a lot. Uh, especially up near the house because I don't want to be smelling it. I know that's so strange. Most people love mint and I can't stand it. But uh, it's actually really, really, really important to have if you can tolerate the smell. It really helps to keep away most insects. This is one of the very best plants for keeping away insects. Uh, it, it'll work on uh, common garden pests like uh, squash bug. We've seen a lot of that over the past few weeks. Lots of squash bug. If you got that, this is something to consider in the future to start planting around the garden to keep those squash bugs not wanting to come in. Uh, mosquitoes. If you have a problem with mosquitoes, I don't know about you guys, but mosquitoes love me. They, they, they just fly in looking for me from wherever they come from. This is great for that. Uh, just a, a large plethora of insects. They're great for this. So uh, they also work on animals. Yes. I was just about to get to that. Yeah. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Uh, they're great for animals. Animals don't like the smell any more than I do. Seriously. <laughs> In fact, uh, the javelina, the mice, the rodents, the, uh, the squirrels and deer, they don't like this. You plant this near the stuff that they've been bothering and they'll usually try to avoid it as much as they possibly can. Uh, yes? What about skunks? Pretty much everything doesn't like it. <laughs> it's just, it's not, animals don't like pungent smells. To them there is no good and bad smells. They don't see fragrance and odor. To them it's just smell of smell. They don't like anything uh, pungent, and so they, they tend to avoid this if they possibly can, unless they're desperate. Is it okay for cats? Because I've heard that cat mint is part of the mint family. A lot of things are part of the mint family. So the question was, does it work on cats? Well, not work, yeah. but is it safe for cats? Oh, it, it's safe. Yeah, it, it's safe for all the animals. They can crawl right across it and nibble at it if they want to. They just don't want to, if they can help it. Okay. Um, so it's, it's one of those, it's great for repelling almost everything, except for spider mites. That's the only thing it doesn't work on, sorry. Uh, you can even crush up some of your herbs, like mint, uh, basil, thyme, and uh, put it into water or steep it in water for a while, and then spray it onto your plants that you need to protect from certain types of insects. So uh, mint is a good one for that. Uh, 
thyme and oregano are great for cabbage moths specifically. Basil is good for aphids. Uh, mint is just more versatile. It, it kind of goes through the whole slew of, of insects. It, they don't like it. So that one is really good. Here's a... Um, uh, yeah, mint definitely spreads. She was talking about what do you do to keep it from spreading and taking over. There's different ways to do that. You can just put it in a pot and have put pots around in or around the garden and, and just keep it in control that way. Uh, if you have beds that say don't, um, can't allow it to spread any further, you may, maybe they're uh, surrounded by pavement. You can let it fill up the bed and it can't go any further. You know, so things like that, you're gonna basically need physical barriers. Very good question. Can you take mint, put it in a pot, and then dig a hole and bury the pot? Eventually, the runners might find their way into the drainage holes and, and go into the soil around it. So I would say put a saucer under the pot, keep it above ground, put a saucer under it. Yeah, so mint. Like I said, it's, it's a spreader <laughs> to the point where you'll, you start thinking of it as kind of invasive. So put it in areas where you want it to do that, where you need a ground cover, or uh, put, it, uh, put it in a pot. And you will always have all the mint you need, and you'll have more mint than you'll probably use, but you can uh, harvest that and use it for things like I said you can spray it, you can actually steep it, and then spray it on things where you need to repel insects and animals. Or you can just crush it up and sprinkle it around the garden and do it that way, it is, it, and the more the better. So if you've got a nice big bed of this, harvest it up and just sprinkle the leaves all over the, the vegetable garden. The more you do that, the better. Yes. So if you were to buy this pot, can you split it? I wouldn't do that right now. I'd let it spread more and, and then go ahead and divide it. Yes? What about bees? bees as well? You know, um, <coughs> the thing about the, the repellent effect on, on the herbs is that it seems to only work on bad bugs. It, 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 the good bugs don't mind, which is amazing. I don't know how the plants know, but <laughs> they, they somehow have that differentiation. So you can actually don't worry about repelling your your uh, your bees and uh, sometimes depending on the herb, the uh, things like butterflies and stuff like that they'll still keep coming. Uh, it depends. Again, like I said, the basil. I was just holding it. So the basil. Um, no, not the basil. It was the oregano and thyme. <laughs> the oregano and thyme are good for the cabbage moth. So. Uh, You'll, get, you'll still get pollinators on it though, but not the full range as, as normal. Sage is another one good for cabbage moth. My favorite vegetables are green. Again, I know that sounds kind of weird. I love broccoli, I love cabbage, I love pretty much anything green. And so for me, the big one is often the, the cabbage moth. So I think sage, thyme, oregano, stay out of my garden. <laughs> They, they like to go for that stuff. They love to go after the, the anything in the cabbage and broccoli family. Let's see. What have I brought up here that I haven't gone over? Ooh, rosemary. I've got a couple of rosemaries up here. There's a lot of different types of rosemary. I've got an upright here. This one just goes straight up, turns into a kind of real upright bush. Um, this one, I can't remember. Ooh, this is one of the, um, that's just about full size, actually. This is like a dwarf. Uh, some of them get huge. Oh. <laughs> it's okay, you can go ahead and take it. She needs my lavender. <laughs> and I do want to cover lavender, because lavender is an important one to go over. This is uh, the upright. Um, some of them turn into big bushes. They're great for landscaping. They're water-wise. They're fragrant. They're all good for cooking. This one is a ground cover type. So again, this is great for slopes, retaining walls, things like that. There's so many different kinds. Some of them are bushy, some of them are straight, some of them are more arching. They all have different effects. They all get to different sizes. Uh, the rosemary, what was the, oh yeah. 
you know what, there's, a, it, there's some interesting things you can do with rosemary. Uh, some of them are cosmetic. Um, they're supposed to be great for um, hair rinses. They're good for your hair and they kind of give it this glow. So like a, almost like an alternative to getting highlights in your hair. Uh, they, they actually uh, bring a, a brightness to the, to the hair, especially in brunettes. They have uh, a way of kind of enhancing the natural sweetness in foods. So you can add this to say things like fruit salads and stuff like that. And instead of using sugar, you would actually just use just a tiny bit of rosemary, not too much, otherwise it'll change the flavor. And it'll actually help to bring out the natural sweetness of the fruit especially here in Arizona, where most of our fruit comes from out of state, and usually they don't ship us the sweetest, ripest stuff. It's actually good to know about stuff like this. So some really interesting uh, things that you can do with rosemary. For me, it's a staple in the kitchen, of course, uh, for soups, salads, cheeses, <laughs> and fruits. Excellent to have around. Now, I want to talk about the lavender. Luckily, I still have a lavender up here that she didn't pay. That lavender did not last long. It came in yesterday, and most of it was sold out within an hour or two. Yikes. <laughs> I guess a lot of people needed lavender yesterday. But I have a lavender here that's been trained into a topiary. So again, you can take your herbs and you can, you can mix them in with your landscape and just and rather than trying to find a spot, because I find a lot of people have that trouble. Where do I put an herb garden? I've got to find a space. What are, where do I put it? Rather than thinking that way, start thinking about how you can just put it right into the landscape. Lavender is beautiful. Where do you need a good flowering shrub? This one is trained into a topiary. Uh, so lavender has a lot of uh, uses. You're going to find yourself using it more and more around the house. I was actually just using it yesterday. I don't know why, but all of a sudden, I have moths. I'm talking about the, the, the little itty bitty teeny tiny moths that like to feed on natural fibers. Um, the ones that mothballs were originally created for. I don't know where they came from, but this year I got inundated by moths out of nowhere. So I just put rosemary into the, the dressers and into the fabrics and, and things like that. And it's a great repellent for them. In fact, you'll go into stores now and you'll find some of the new mothballs are being made with lavender because the old ones were highly toxic. They weren't safe to even use. You shouldn't even have some of those in the house. They're so strong. And we actually had an incident involving mothballs once where uh, it involved uh, taking one of the pets to the hospital. <laughs> so the, the lavender is a far less toxic alternative. So I just you know, harvesting lavender, using lavender oil uh, in places where the, the moths were gathering, where I know they would, bre would be breeding, I was taking care of that. So I was just uh, putting a, in an application uh, uh, where I hadn't yet yesterday, because I hadn't gone around to it. So it's very, very effective for uh, uh, repelling certain types of insects, especially in closed spaces like that. And it smells good. It has a very, um, excellent aromatherapy value. Uh, it's calming, it's soothing. It, it, it's one of the uh, favorites, in just a sec, for, uh, for calming and soothing. So putting it in your baths, putting it in your face scrubs with sugars or salts for exfoliation are very effective. Putting it in your foot baths, it helps to kind of help soothe those aches and pains. It's also antiseptic, antibacterial, antifungal, again, Lavender is what I used when I had those fungal infections, and it worked. Um, highly effective. In fact, they've been doing clinical studies on it because they're looking for safe, natural alternatives to start making antifungal uh, creams and things out of. Lavender is what they did the study on. So you'll be seeing more of that starting to take shelf space from those classic, uh, say, athlete foot creams and stuff like that. You're going to see more lavender start to take over. Um, you, I've actually seen uh, diaper uh, baby wipes and other types of wipes made from this. You just take uh, some lavender or some lavender oil, just a tiny, tiny bit, mix it with some water, put a real shallow bit into a container, and then put some Viva brand uh, paper towels in there. Other paper towels can be used too, but the Viva seems to work 
better. It just holds up better when it's wet. And it has the right texture. You put some of that in there and just let it soak up, and let it wick up the oils and water, and it makes an excellent wipe for the bathroom or for the, for the babies. Very safe for babies, so it's a, a great alternative. If you're looking for something that doesn't have the formaldehydes and other types of clean cleaners, I mean, that's what those are, uh, lavender is excellent for that. It's great for things like uh, scrapes and other types of you know, scratches, things like that where you just kind of need to clean it because it's, it's got that uh, antiseptic, antibacterial, antifungal property. So another very, very versatile herb. You'll find yourself wanting to keep this one around. So which part of the plant do you use? So which part of the plant do you use? Both the leaves and the flowers, actually. Yeah, they're both, both good for all of that. And they're pretty, and they smell good. They have kind of an almost lemony fragrance to it, but with a, something I can't quite describe. Let's see. Yes. Yes, with the lavender, after it does a little profuse blooming, mm -hmm. does it like to get a good haircut? Yes. Yes. By all means, go ahead and, and uh, when it's done blooming, cut off all the flowers and hey, uh, depending on how soon you do it, you might even be able to get some use out of them for their herbal, herbal uses. So yes, by all means, uh, go ahead and do that. It'll help it to bloom a little more as well. There are some things now that you would want to go to seed. Uh, I will say that a lot of these uh, kitchen herbs, you know, when they go to seed, someone was just asking me this morning, do I cut the flowers off of, of my herbs? Say basil, oregano, things like that. Do you cut the flowers off? Kind of depends on what you're going to be using it for. If it's for culinary use, cut the flowers off immediately as soon as you see them. Yeah. Try your best to keep it from blooming, actually because when they bloom, they lose flavor. They start putting a lot of their energy and nutrients and oils into the seed instead of the leaves, and they just pull from the rest of the plant. So if you're using it for culinary use, you actually want to cut those flowers off as soon as you see them forming. Just don't even let them do that. Sometimes it's hard to stop them, but try to, uh, sometimes it, just cutting them once is enough to do it. It just depends on the plant, but by all means, if it's for culinary use, cut the flowers off immediately. Don't even let them form. If you're using, if you're actually needing the flowers for herbal remedies, or if you're needing the seed, for example, the cilantro. Again, cilantro is coriander. <coughs> the leaves are cilantro. The seed is the coriander. So if you're planning on harvesting your own coriander, you would let this go to seed. It's kind of hard to keep this from bolting anyway, so you may as well just <laughs> enjoy the coriander. And coriander does have herbal uses of its own, though I don't remember exactly what. I think it was for poultices, if I recall correctly, for you know certain types of injuries. All right. Let's see, what else have we haven't we covered? I know we had a lot of questions that I wanted to go over. So rose hips, do they have to be dried or can they be used fresh? Either. Um, the best rose hips that you're going to have. And it's going to be about October, November, uh, probably about November. So leave them on. If you want to, uh, I always say for flower gardeners, you always want to cut the flowers off uh, to encourage blooming. But if you're wanting to get the hips, then you would obviously let, leave them on. You can do both. You can actually just uh, cut deadhead during the summertime and enjoy the flowers because you're really your best hips are going to be at the end of the season. So if you just wait until you know that last batch of flowers at the end of the season, don't deadhead at the end of the season. Let the hips remain. Let them sit there while it gets cold. And you'll find that they ripen up more than the ones in the warm season. That, that, that cold, even the light frost, will actually help them ripen better. They'll swell up bigger than the rest of the, the growing season. And they'll actually start to turn an orange color. That's when you harvest. Those are going to be your best rose hips. They'll have kind of a, most people call it a sort of cranberry flavor. They're even good in things like uh, chutneys and jams and things that you would normally put cranberries in. Um, put them into a fruit salad if you like cranberries in your fruit salad. Put them into a green salad. I love cranberries in a green salad. Uh, harvest the, the, the rose hips. If you're going to eat them fresh, you want to cut it open 
and remove the seeds, you'll find these real fuzzy things inside. Um, those will get caught in your throat when you try to eat it. Uh, so uh, remove those. So just cut, cut the hips into quarters, remove the seeds so they don't catch and make you cough and choke. And then use them however you plan to use them. Or you can dry them and then you don't have to worry about removing the seed because you'll never open them up and chew them. In that case, just dry them out, save them, and then uh, you can steep them in tea, uh, do a number of things with them at that point. You'll even find uh, rose hips in, say, the natural health food stores and things like that uh, for making teas and herbal remedies with. And the petals, uh, they can be used uh, for a number of things. You can put petals into salads and fruit salads and other dishes, um, or you can distill them, uh, which involves a steaming process, and make rose water which has huge plethora of uses as well. So there's different things you can do with that. Let's see, what else? Someone, uh, the little purple Yes, yeah, The little purple plant. This is actually a basil. Basil, yeah. Yeah, this is a basil. Uh, this, is, this one's called Purple Ruffles, has excellent, excellent flavor, looks pretty. So you can mix it in with your other plants and it just looks really nice when you put it into uh, and to your salads and foods. The color gives it a really nice look. Uh, it, it's pretty useful. This is the purple ruffles, basil. Same flavor? Y yes, excellent flavor, yes. This is actually a, a common favorite. So you'll, you'll find that you do like that one. Other than the cilantro, are there basically perennials? Let's see, how many of these perennials, the rosemary, the sage is kind of a, it gets through most winters, but if you have a real cold one, you might lose your sage. Um, to keep it lasting longer, you can just kind of put it up by a wall or in a corner where it stays a little warmer. Uh, the rosemaries are excellent. The oregano is excellent. Mint, thyme, they all go through the winter. I have beds of this stuff at home. A lot of times what I'll do is, uh, rather than having the bed in the ground, I'll have it in the pot around other plants. For example, I have a rose in a pot with thyme growing around it. Uh, one of the shorter thymes, I think the one I have is a creeping or chance, it's, it's thick like this. And have that spilling over the edges of the pot. It looks really, really pretty. And then I have thyme as well. I also like the golden thyme. It's a really, really pretty looking thyme. It's, uh, it's green and gold. It just really, really pretty. Um, I, do, I have uh, oregano in a pot at the moment. What else do I have? So I have mixed in. I don't have a, an herb area. I just mix them in wherever I need plants that look like that. Let's see, uh, what was the other thing I was looking at? Um, the oregano is, is, the basil is not, and you're gonna lose that in winter. You have to bring it in or replace it each year. The bay leaf is another one. This goes down to something like 15, 20 degrees. You'll lose it, but not until the dead of winter. Uh, so you can leave this out in say October, part of November. It's not until it gets really cold that you have to bring this one in. Um, then you can just bring it in and make it into a house plant. Um, it actually grows into a small tree, so you could keep this trimmed into a decorative bush in a pot and bring it in. Uh, to say a, a, a garage with windows or into the house and turn it into a nice looking house plant and then in the summertime put it out and it's going to look real pretty in a pot because it's just a nice looking plant. It is evergreen. Um, you won't lose the leaves when it gets cold but if it gets too cold, yes, it will die. And let's see, here there's a tag on here. It has hardiness level. So yeah, it's a approximately 15-ish degrees so it, it's it's not going to come in until probably late november maybe december yeah what about fertilizing fertilizing great question what do you do about the fertilizing uh, this is the one i use for literally everything this is the all-purpose food has a very long wide range of nutrients micronutrients macronutrients so this is good for all of it because it has it's such a complete meal. You can use it for everything. It's very well balanced. Um, I use it on the herbs. You do want to use a little fertilizer on your, on your herbs. Don't go nuts with it. It can change the flavor of the herbs. A lot of these, like the oreganos and the sages and 
uh, a lot of these herbs that are real high in oils that uh, tend to be more cold hardy, they will actually lose flavor and become a little bit bitter if they're over fertilized. So don't go nuts. Lighter is better. So keep a nice light sprinkle. You can also plant herbs in with your vegetable garden, as I said before, and then they're sharing nutrients with the vegetables, and that's okay with them. <laughs> so they're fine with that. Yes? Is the top one on that bay leaf the size of the plant? Because we have a bay leaf in our yard, which is about 12 feet tall, and that's the cost. So there are different types of bay leaf, yes. Um, this particular one is called Little Ragu. The leaves are a little bit smaller than the other bay leaf. So that's why it looks different to you. Uh, yes, it does. If this were to be allowed to grow outside year round in a warm climate like he had, yes, it turns into a small tree. Uh, depending on. Yeah, Florida, California. <laughs> yeah, and how big they get just depends on which variety you have. Like I said, this is actually kind of a smaller variety. Uh, if you were, say, leaving, uh, this one only gets to about six to eight foot. It's more of a bush. Um, the one you had would have been a full-size tree. Some of them grow to 12 foot. Sounds like you knew of some that got even bigger. Yeah. So this is this is a, the fertilizer I like to use. It's It breaks down slowly. Um, it just works very well for herbs. You don't want to, like I said, have something that works too fast or, or anything like that. Yes? 744? Yeah, this is a 744. How often? How often? Yeah, just every three months. Yeah. And don't don't overdo it. Let's see. Yes. All right. Any other questions? Yes. So when you break them in, since herbs are naturally insect repellent, mm -hmm. is there anything we need to be aware of so we don't bring bugs in? So uh, I would say with all plants, it's it's good to spread them down with some horticultural oil before bringing them in. But with the herbs, it is less of a problem because they're naturally bug repellent. There are very few bugs that are able to stand herbs, and generally each, each of those bugs will go for only one kind of herb. So yes, if you want to play it safe, go ahead and spray it down with either horticultural or neem oil, uh, just, and also maybe put some diatomaceous earth on, on the surface of the, the soil and into the drainage holes in case of fungus gnats. But again, you're not going to have as many problems with, with the herbs because they're naturally repellent towards bugs, some more than others, obviously. Okay, so and yes, I'm um, starting those in a pot. Mm -hmm. What what's the mixture of the soil? So regular potting soil is great. Just a good quality pot, potting soil. Um, I would I would skip potting soils that have fertilizer in them already because some of them are just too rich for herbs and it will change their flavor in a negative way. So go for something that doesn't have it already. Be in control of your fertilizing. Uh, other than that, like I said, they're, they're actually pretty easy. So we're kind of kind of wind down here. I'm going to say one thing because I know you guys have been waiting and waiting and waiting for it. It's here. It arrived. The flower power is in. I know everybody's been in here every single day asking, is the flower power here yet? It just arrived. So if you want to come in, new and improved formula just arrived. So come on in, get your flower power, and also new and improved formula, root and grow. All right? So it's also, here. Also mention the monsoon sale. And we are having our monsoon sale right now. So we've got really great clearance prices on trees, shrubs, vines, and other stuff. So uh, if you haven't come in yet, you need to be in here right now to get your stuff. All right? How do you use the flower power? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll get to that just okay. in a second. So we're going to go ahead and wind down. We're going to say goodbye to our, our friends online, and I'll be available for questions. Okay? Thank you.